Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming along to the, the latest in the UK CCSRC's webinar series, where today we're going to be showcasing um, some of the, the current CCS research that's going on in the country um, by some of our early career researchers. So we've got five speakers today, and um, they're all going to speak on a variety of topics. Uh, they'll have 15 minutes to talk, and then we'll have a five minute Q&A afterwards. Um, as Mel has mentioned in the chat, um, if everybody could remain muted and, and have their cameras off during the presentations. If you have questions um, for the speakers, feel free to either put them in the chat or at the end, um, I'll check for, for hands raised and, and we can um, you can come and ask your question on the mic if you'd like. So we have five speakers today. We've also got a, a short break just after two o'clock to recharge. But we're going to start off today with Nadine Mustafa from Imperial College London. And Nadine's going to speak to us about the influence of chemical kinetics and interfacial resistance on CO2 absorption. Um, so Nadine, if you could share your slides um, and just to remind all the speakers, I'll go off camera um, and then once 13 minutes has passed, I'll turn my camera on to give you a two minute warning. So take it away, Nadine. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Nadine. I'm a PhD researcher uh, in the chemical engineering department at Imperial College of London. And uh, my presentation today is titled The Influence of Chemical Kinetics and Interfacial Resistance on CO2 Absorption Rates into Aqueous Amine Solvents. Um, I, I thought to keep this brief because I'm assuming everyone here knows why CCS is important. But essentially, just to kind of give a quick recap, it's important in terms of decarbonization of the heart abate industries, such as, for instance, aviation or steel making or cement, uh, enabling the production of low carbon hydrogen at scale. So in this case, blue hydrogen, uh, providing low carbon dispatchable power and delivering negative emissions for the unavoidable residual emissions that we are going to have uh, even after doing all the abatement options in the different industries. So um, so what, what are the current status and challenges that exist and, and why essentially getting into why my research uh, is important or hopefully important? Um, essentially, uh, carbon capture has been done for, the, for, for decades uh, in the sense of natural gas weeping and specifically when it comes to amine solvents, that's where my research uh, focuses on. Uh, it's currently costs around $60 per ton of CO2. Obviously, that depends on, on where you're getting your costing from, and it needs to be around $25 per ton for it to be as economically feasible as possible. Um, it's important to note that industry has uh, different operating conditions. So like it depends on whether you're looking at a power plant or if you're looking at a cement plant, for instance, or if you're even looking at direct air capture. Um, and when it comes down to it, there's... Uh, a lot of different amines with different structures and um, given that we also and they, each amine has its different advantages and disadvantages and hence uh, why we use blends in a lot of instances to overcome some of those disadvantages which essentially is, is good in a sense because we can uh, we can play around with them but also it gives us um, infinite blends we could basically change so much uh, about our amine and so it gets a bit hard to optimize it if we're only doing screening experiments. And um, it's also important to note that although we do have a lot of uh, different options, um, such as adsorbents or ionic liquids and, and, and so on and so forth, a lot of them actually do use amines as promoters. So, um, so even though, for instance, we use a lot of adsorbents in direct air capture, amines are still used as uh, really good promoters in this case. And so it's extremely important to further on, uh, enhance our understanding when it comes to amines. So where does my work fit in? So based on the title, I looked into the interplay of, of kinetics and mass transfer uh, to, that affects CO2 absorption efficiency and essentially their performance uh, by looking at parameters, including CO2 loading absorption rates and, and mass transfer coefficients. Um, Essentially, I want to elucidate what, what, how does mass transfer and kinetics affect um, CO2 absorption performance, and that it is kind of like a, a meta study with the aim to uh, facilitate the selection of improved solvent blends uh, for a more cost effective and environmentally benign uh, CO2 capture process. And I, I've added here, oh, sorry, I've added here um, 
some um, papers, two papers specifically, uh, that look into uh, modeling um, the different amines. Um, and essentially, they use experimental results, for instance, such as such as mine, not specifically mine, but they would use uh, experimental results such as mine to to enhance those kinetic models, um, especially given the fact that, as with any models, we we have to un undergo a lot of assumptions. So just to give a brief overview of my experimental methods, um, I'm going to start with the continuous dirt tank reactor. Um, so I'm just going to put my pointer option. I don't know if you can see my pointer option. Um, not sure. Um, anyway, so the my CSTR, essentially, I've done a lot of experiments on it. And um, my, the point of it was to get uh, CO2 loading, um, absorption rates, pH, and mass transfer coefficients when I changed uh, some of the configuration. And basically, uh, I was I had a, a known volume of amine there with a certain concentration um, and CO2 being pumped in, pure CO2 being pumped in. And there was a lower log syringe where I took samples every, um, depending on the experiment, but let's say every five or 10 minutes uh, that, that was that I did um, further analysis on and a mass uh, flow controller before and after. So essentially using the mass balance, I could get my CO2 loadings. Uh, I could also uh, calculate the absorption rates, um, the pH, I had a pH probe and mass transfer coefficients essentially were calculated when I changed the diffuser. Instead of having a diffuser that bubbles CO2 inside, um, I, I had a blanketing approach essentially where the CO2 was not bubbled through the liquid, but instead it was blanketed on top of the, on top of the amine solvent. And I show here on, on, in, in the middle, essentially the experiments that I've, I've done and they change in terms of temperatures. So I've done uh, experiments at 60, 40, and 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, I've done experiments at different concentrations, so, so a higher concentration of 30% and a lower concentration of 10%. And a CO2 flow rate, a low, a low CO2 flow rate of 250 and a high CO2 flow rate of 990, and stir speeds of 300 uh, RPM and 50 RPM. And the amines I've studied were MEA, so monoethanol amine, methyl diethanol amine, MDEA, which is a tertiary amine, uh, AMP, which is a sterically hindered uh, primary amine, and paparazin, which is a cyclic uh, diamine. And the point of this um, uh, experimental method is essentially to get a graph that looks like this. Um, again, this is just this is just for a visualization, but essentially I could plot uh, the pH change uh, versus the CO2 loading. The next set of experiments revolved around uh, a wetted wall column, uh, where essentially I could calculate mass transfer coefficients and the effect of, of loading. So I've also looked into partially loaded amines and how that affects mass transfer coefficients. And, and again, here I've just added um, a, visu um, a brief visualization of some of the mass transfer coefficients that I've uh, got from uh, the wetted wall column experiments. And finally, the samples that I mentioned that I took um, every five to 10 minutes from the CSTR, they, I did an analysis on them uh, using um, NMR, so nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, and essentially that, was you, that analysis was extremely important in determining reaction mechanism, mechanisms, uh, but also um, get, another, get another point of CO2 loading. As, so it's not just from the mass balance, but also from NMR and have that for comparison. Um, as well as the different mole fractions of the different species that that uh, that exist in the system um, with with time, and so putting all of those experiments together, um, again, th those were quite a lot of experiments, and so I'm not going to show all of these experiments. Instead, I'm going to show a, a taster of some of them. Um, but essentially, the point of this. Um, somewhat of a meta study was to get the influence of chem chemical kinetics and interfacial mass transfer resistance uh, on CO2 absorption rates into aqueous amine solvents. And I do that by changing the operating conditions so that at some points, um, 
uh, we look into um, essentially as limiting as possible when it comes to mass transfer uh, versus uh, kinetics by changing the operating conditions that I've mentioned, but but mainly the, the CO2 concentration, uh, sorry, the CO2 flow rate, so from a high to low CO2 flow rate, and the amine concentration, again, from a high to low amine concentration. And those, those kind of experiments were designed uh, using essentially statistical analysis and, and basically design of experiments. Um, and they were based on the uh, they were based on the limits of my uh, experimental apparatus. So uh, here I show the effect of different regimes, and by regimes I mean the 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 higher low mass transfer or the limiting kinetics and and limiting uh, mass transfer. And you can see here I've plotted MEA, MDA, AMP, and paparazin, uh, and so. Essentially, uh, the, all of those all of those experiments are done at uh, sixty degrees Celsius, um, and with varying concentration, amine concentration, and CO two flow rate, and with an impeller speed of three hundred RPM. And each graph shows the change of pH versus uh, dimensionless time. So dimensionless time is the time it actually takes in real life divided by the theoretical time that it would take if it was constantly uh, it was if it's constantly absorbed. So essentially, it assumes that mass transfer has has no effect um and so you could see here obviously if if it was if it if an experiment would finish at one then that would mean that as soon as the co2 was uh inputted into the, or diffu uh, bubbled into the liquid it was um instantly uh absorbed and so essentially um you can see here the different effects of the different regimes at di for different structural amines not structural amines, different am so amines with different structures. Um, and it affects some of the amines more than others. Um, also, another observation is the fact that um, pH, the, a lower pH generally signifies a, a higher CO2 loading. Uh, but again, that the, the effect, the, the amount of that depends on the amine you're looking at. Um, here I show the absorption rates uh, for the different um, for the different amines and experiments. Um, so essentially, I only added these to kind of show you, give you a brief uh, look at what happens. So all the graphs, all the plots at the bottom here are are um, are done at the low mass transfer, so the limiting uh, mass transfer regime, and all the ones that are generally at the top. Uh, those are the ones that were done at a uh, high mass transfer regime. Um, yeah. And so essentially, uh, some of the, so some of them have like extra peaks. So you could see here for, for MEA or for MDA. And those kind of peaks actually also helped when it came to the NMR analysis, because then you could see uh, the the. Oh, I just realized you guys couldn't see my pointer. But anyway. So this is the low mass transfer regime, and this is the high mass transfer regime. And uh, essentially, a high mass transfer regime was done at a, a higher CO2 flow rate and a lower amine concentration. And uh, the, the vice versa is true uh, here, where it was done with a higher amine concentration, but a uh, lower CO2 flow rate. And in this case, uh, in all of them, you could see that uh, mass transfer obviously has a huge uh, has a huge impact, which is actually an extremely important observation, and obviously it, it can be an obvious observation, but the extent of that is, is important to consider. Um, and it's important also to consider uh, the changes that will make in terms of speciation, because as I said, a lot of models do certain assumptions, such as, for instance, some of them ignore uh, gas uh, phase mass transfer resistance, and some of them ignore liquid uh, phase mass transfer resistance. It depends on, depends on the model. And, um, the, the results when you look at them from a, like a zoomed out point of view so instead of getting a localized um conclusion uh you can see that at different instances both can have extremely uh, significant uh, effects and it also showcases the fact that um screening experiments can be done when, with a lot more um again zoomed out point of view because um, as a, for instance, if you were to look into uh, literature and look into the CO2 loading of MEA for, for, or, or MDA, um, or let's say MEA, it can range anywhere between 0 0.4, 0 0.4 and, and 0 0.8 of moles, moles of CO2 per mole of amine. Um, and so 
it's extremely important to look at look at it from a, a zoomed up point of view because each experimental apparatus and each uh, person undergoing this uh, research will will get a somewhat different uh, result and that will depend on the influence of the interplay uh, of uh, chemical kinetics with the interfacial uh, mass transfer resistance and the other thing I pointed out before realizing that I uh, that I that I didn't have the pointer was those peaks were actually extremely helpful to show that that actually at some point in the experiment uh, extra species were shown in the analysis that we did with uh, with NMR and again some of those some of those experiments showed uh, pretty much a constant. Uh, CO2 absorption rate in terms of, for instance, in terms of pairs, and that was the maximum. So at that point, uh, it was basically absorbing all of the CO2 that you're you're putting in, which is obviously not the case for for MDA, which is a tertiary amine and hence a slower amine. Um, so here again, I show um, some results from the um, NMR from the uh, C13 NMR spectroscopy. Um, so essentially what, what I did was that we, so this graph, for instance, shows an experiment that's done with MEA. And again, you could see the change of pH with, with, in terms of dimensionless time, as well as the CO2 loading. Um, and the green lines here represent the different times, uh, the different samples that are shown here in terms of mole fraction. And those mole fractions were calculated based on the, uh, spectroscopy results. Um, and essentially, interestingly, for instance, in the ter in terms of MEA, you could uh, see carbamic acid, which is one of the roots that usually that one of the reaction mechanisms that that uh, people look into in literature. Um, um, and you could only really see carb you could only see carb carbamic acid when it came to um, MEA. Um, and in terms of AMP here. Uh, again, it was the same kind of concept, but essentially, I added these graphs to showcase one of the one of the, one of the conclusions that came up with this work is that, um, for instance, bicarbonate uh, formation was heavily uh, influenced depending on mass transfer. So, for instance, here in MEA, when it came to the the limiting mass transfer regime, there was no uh, there was very little bicarbonate produced, whereas uh, when it came to the limiting kinetics regime, so at higher mass transfer, uh, bicarbonate carbonate was produced uh, quite late in the game, but it, it was produced. And in terms of AMP, you could see it was instantly produced here. And uh, again, so another uh, another thing that came out of this work is the identification of minor species uh, that were produced depend as the experiment went on. So for instance, in this case, green here showed AMP carbonate. And again, you could see that at a higher mass transfer, it's actually uh, produced uh, in the beginning, but it quickly dissociates um, and fully forms bicarbonate instead. This again was done for all of the experiments that I've mentioned initially for all of the different amines, but this is essentially just to sh showcase some of the results and um, explain how we got into their conclusion. Nadim, you're yeah. pretty much out of speaking time. If you want, we can keep on going and. Uh, eat into your question oh. time or do you want to wrap up so you've got no that's time fine I'll, I'll wrap up with deliverables sorry uh, to cut you off no no that's fine um sorry about that i i, I tried really hard to okay. like not add so many <laughs> experiments <laughs> Uh, That's okay. anyway, the deliverables of this work essentially was to identify um, a different species and in, in the co2 amine uh, systems for different amines using the using nmr essentially as i said including a lot of minor species that usually were ignored and uh, i mean they're usually ignored in a lot of models but also not identified in nmr um, um, studies reaction mechanisms were highlighted and how those are affected by mass transfer um, the interplay of kinetics and mass transfer was analyzed and considered. This is important, again, as I said, to give a zoomed out point of view of how, how things work when it comes to amines. And it's important in terms of modeling so that we can optimize uh, amines as much as possible. As I said, we have a great understanding when it comes to amines, but we, we, we need to kind of optimize them further for all the different applications that we need them for, whether it's promoters or um, just solvent-based um, carbon capture. The effect of different setups on mass transfer coefficients was outlined. As I said, I looked into the CSTR, but with a different configuration, as well as the wetted wall column. And those mass transfer coefficients were, um, were, were used as a comparison. 
And essentially, the, a combination of this interaction systems map of this work increases the fundamental understanding of CO2 absorption uh, process under um, different conditions and, and different amines. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Nadim. Um, we have time for a couple of quick questions. If anybody, so if anybody has a question, feel free to type it in the chat or stick your hand up and we can unmute and ask your question. I will keep an eye on the chat. And any burning questions? Sharon, you've got your hand up. Feel free to unmute. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that great talk, Nadine. Um, I was just wondering if you could give us a little bit of insight uh, based on the work you've done comparing uh, kind of the state of the art amine-based carbon capture systems we see in industry versus uh, your findings here. Uh, do you feel like there are modifications that can be made in terms of um, the kinetics and mass transfer or even the types of amines made uh, being used? Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, that's a great question. So. I think initially when I was doing all these experiments, the analysis was really hard because I was like, how does this make a difference? I'm literally looking at an interface. Uh, but when I started working with industry, um, as I said, like this is extremely important when you look into different kind of uh, operating conditions when it comes to industry. So uh, looking into a carbon capture unit um, in a power plant would be extremely different to what's happening with direct air capture, specifically in terms of, of mass transfer. And so the influence of, of mass transfer resistance, whether it comes from a liquid phase perspective or a gas phase perspective, which again will be different depending on the process you're looking at, uh, will influence the kind of amines that you would want to consider. And it also increases the understanding that once you look into screening, so go, go ahead and do all the screening experiments you want to do, but once you look into doing them, uh, it, first of all, it narrows down how much screening experiments you need to do. And secondly, once you do them, it massively enhances your understanding and how to optimize them further, depending on your specific operating conditions in industry. And in this case, for instance, the difference between power plants and direct air capture is, is huge. Got it. Thank you so much. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Nadine. Um, okay. So next talk. Um, next, we have uh, Nikolaus Repas from Newcastle University. And Nikolaus is going to be talking to us about thermohydromechanical analysis of rock formations subject to lower temperature CO2 sequestration. So Nikolaus, if you can um, share your screen and slides. Yes, of course, yeah. yeah. Away you That's go. Great. Yeah. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Nikolaus Repas, and I did my PhD at Newcastle University on thermohydromechanical effects on rock formations uh, that are subject to low temperature CO2 uh, injection and storage. And my PhD project uh, was fully funded by EPSRC. And currently, I'm a teaching associate uh, and uh, researcher, uh, postdoc researcher at Sunlight University. And my postdoc here is at Foundations and Improving Risk Assessment and Prioritizing Processes for Management of SCOUR at different uh, uh, structures. Uh, I would like to thank all my supervisory team at Newcastle University for all the great work uh, we achieved. And uh, to start to start my presentation, firstly, it is well known that CO2 can be stored permanently in depleted oil and gas fields, deep saline aquifers, and coal seams. Um, to, to ensure that we successfully inject um, and we have a stability um, in terms of long-term storage, reliable geomechanical characterization is really, really important and uh, to prevent any damage on the wellbore, on the reservoir and on the ceiling formation uh, of uh, the rock. In this way, uh, the leakage risk can be uh, minimized. Uh, however, some uh, key issues uh, may arise uh, like, uh, uh, firstly, the thermal loadings due to the temperature difference between the injected CO2 and, of course, the wellbore um, uh, formation. Uh, as we know, we have two different types of uh, uh, injection. Uh, we can inject through pipelines or by transporting from ship. 
to the injection sites, we are, which are mainly based offshore. And in pipeline injection, and, uh, uh, some problems can be uh, the thermal loading due to the joule thompson effect as um, uh, pressurized and the CO2 is injected in uh, under pressurized uh, wellbore uh, formation and expands and uh, drops the temperature and also uh, due to injection uh, from a ship uh, where the, the CO2 is being uh, kept, uh, for example, for transportation at minus 50 degrees and uh, 07 MPA pressure and for uh, when it is being injected, it is being heated up to the wellbore uh, to the wellbore head uh, uh, temperature, and uh, that's um, uh, an, an energetically burdensome. And injecting at lower temperatures than the seabed uh, formation is really important, as um, uh, uh, and it can be very promising to uh, save some energy. Uh, and if the damage uh, to the wellbore um, uh, stability, is, to the wellbore um, formation, is prevented. Uh, one other issue um, is uh, the cycling thermomechanical loading that is being uh, um, uh, that is being uh, that the wellbore is being affected from as uh, the ships are not injecting CO2 uh, constantly and to have shutdowns and shutups uh, during uh, uh, 24 hours and breaks. Then. Uh, in literature, there are a lot of um, uh, uh, there are not a lot of constitutive models that can describe a fully coupled thermohydromechanical model about a rock that can exist nearby the wellbore uh, formation, and also uh, there is a, a lack uh, of experimental uh, and numerical simulations uh, uh, which aims to optimize the parameters used for the wellbore. Uh, modeling. So all these issues needs uh, were addressed in uh, this research, uh, and uh, further research needs to be done in the future to have um, uh, some really promising uh, results. Uh, the project main aim was to develop what I mentioned before, a fully coupled uh, model that can describe the influence of the injected CO2 to the wellbore uh, wall. And uh, some of um, uh, the main objectives was uh, firstly. Uh, that uh, uh, we managed um, uh, to create um, a theoretical constituted model and numerical implement and a last of last embodying surface about rock uh, in order to be used uh, for the final coupled thermohydromechanical uh, model. Uh, UCS and triaxial tests were also undertaken at Newcastle University at different wellbore conditions and different temperatures. When I'm talking about wellbore conditions, we just changed the confining pressure at triaxial test in order to reproduce the certain uh, conditions and all um, uh, the, the model, uh, the thermohydromechanical model was validated against literature and test uh, data. And then the estimation of the effect of various CO2 injection uh, scenarios on the surrounding wellbore rock was uh, achieved. Um, so I, I designed that graph in order to show you how the flow of the um, uh, of the PhD project um, uh, uh, ran. So firstly, the governing equations were created in, and also the experimental re results were achieved in order the thermohydromechanical model uh, to be created. Um, uh, when um, when I'm speaking about uh, governing equations, we have all those deformation model, flow model, uh, thermal model. Uh, the damage evolution um, uh, during any uh, loading of the rock formation, the bounding surface model was adopted uh, as an extended cam clay model, uh, plasticity effects and also hardening effects. And then uh, from the experimental results, uh, uh, we used also again a finite element model to reproduce them. And in this way, after feeding the curves to the experimental results, uh, as we know from the triaxial and UCS tests, we can produce stress strain curves and uh, um, circumferential or axial strain curves. Uh, by feeding those curves to those data, we can have an estimation of the critical state parameters, which are all implemented to the final thermohydromechanical model. And finally, we have. Uh, the estimation of the effective stresses and of the pore and fissure pressure to the wellbore formation, and also the percentage of the damage that is being measured due to the loadings. 
Um, so the fact, um, as, as I mentioned before, it's really important to uh, study the subzero temperature on a rock formation uh, due to possibly the Joule Thompson effect uh, from a pipeline transportation and injection or uh, due uh, to injection from ships at lower temperature in order not to spend a lot of energy in order to heat up the CO2 at the well bore um, head conditions. So for these reasons, we did uniaxial and triaxial compression tests. And um, uh, here we can see uh, how the sample was trained codes, the different uh, the hook cell and also the environmental chamber at the University of Newcastle. The statements have shown, uh, the results showed that it presented an elastic plastic behavior, which was uh, highly dependent on the confining pressure and on the temperature conditions. And uh, it was identified that decreasing the temperature for 15 degrees, which may be a supercritical injection of CO2 uh, to sub-zero conditions, uh, the breed behavior of rock uh, is increased. Uh, as the Poisson ratio is dropping down and the strength uh, of the material increases. One interesting outcome, which uh, uh, is already submitted for publication recently, is that the Poisson ratio on some experiments tends to be out bigger than 0 0.5. And this was explained microscopically um, uh, by uh, showing some grain realignment and dilation uh, of uh, the material. The publication will be out uh, soon. Uh, so apart from the experiments, uh, we did I did also create a finite element model um, uh, using uh, um, uh, that could satisfactorily reproduce triaxial tests and test made the different critical state parameters as I mentioned on my previous slide. Each critical state parameter can influence different parts of the stress strain curves. And uh, in this way, we can have a perfect estimation of the values and we can implement those values at the final THM model. We can see here the validation of the numerical and experimental data. This is an example um, and uh, all of them are being published uh, uh, at a conference for American Rock Mechanics Association uh, last uh, year. Uh, as far as it concerns now the wellbore simulations, a unique thickness of wellbore is uh, simulated uh, with uh, uh, the outer radius being uh, around 800 meters in order uh, to describe the boundary conditions at the far field. And the vertical deformation was assumed to be a constraint and an axisymmetric uh, uh, formulation was adopted. Uh, as the loading conditions uh, display some symmetry about uh, uh, the vertical uh, axis. Uh, at each study depth, as we can see uh, here, we have the 50 meters and the 1000 uh, uh, meter, different uh, internal temperature and inter internal pressure are, exist there, and also different conditions at the far uh, field. So uh, I would like to show you some of um, uh, the results, uh, uh, for example, for the 50 meters depth, uh, where we have studied four different internal temperatures, which may be some representative case scenarios about uh, injected uh, CO2. One interesting outcome uh, uh, about that one um, was the negative pore pressure for the minus 10 uh, degrees and uh, which indicate um, some stress relief, some tensile behavior of the material, um, uh, and uh, which um, we can say cavitation of water in porous and, uh, and uh, which can lead to potential uh, fracturing. Again, we can see uh, how uh, by changing the temperature, the internal temperature of the formation, uh, also the radial and hoop effective stress is changing. And it's quite obvious that uh, uh, if we consider that the positive values is the compressive stress uh, by dropping the temperature, uh, the, the tensile stress, sorry, by dropping the temperature, tens tensile effects are increased. <coughs> I'm sorry. Then uh, we have um, the damage effects. And uh, as we can see, by dropping the temperature, damage is being increased again from 7% uh, to almost 9% at uh, the wellbore uh, wall. 
Um, here we have a slight different change after a reduction uh, from minus five to minus 10, but this was maybe due to the limited uh, experimental data we had, but it can also said that dropping the temperature further from minus uh, five uh, degrees, um, this may have a different impact um, to uh, the pores and to the fracture uh, medium. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so, as far as it concerns now, um, what is happening to the pore and fissure pressure in time, uh, we can see that we have a higher impact on the pore pressure at an early response. Uh, this is about uh, 80 seconds of injection, the first 80 seconds what the wellbore wall is, is, is feeling, and we can see that we have uh, this is, uh, for example, the radial distance uh, from uh, the wellbore, and this is um, the, the pore uh, pressures. And this is uh, the fissure pressure, and also again the radial uh, distance uh, from the wellbore. It is, uh, it can be seen that um, uh, we have a higher impact on pore pressure at early response due to permeability. Um, as the pore pressure has less permeability than the fracture uh, network. And also, in time, damage is in increases and it starts from 80%. And after 300, uh, 3,200 uh, seconds, it goes almost 16%. Uh, so, uh, to sum up, uh, a thin element model uh, was satisfactorily and uh, uh, quite well implemented in MATLAB and the robust and precise way. It is a robust and precise way to reproduce the reaction test data and estimate critical state parameters. Experimental tests were also performed to achieve the mechanical parameters of state and sandstone, and um, also uh, expanding uh, our results uh, to CCS application. Freezing thermal loading can increase the strength of the rock. However, uh, a sub zero temperature can decrease. Uh, the Poisson ratio, which can make the rock more vulnerable to fracture and potential uh, uh, damage. So we need to consider how much lower uh, the injection of the CO2 uh, can be. Uh, and it also it was identified that the hoop area, mainly the wellbore head, that the difference between the wellbore wall and the injected CO2 um, uh, brings tensile strength uh, to rise and the material to expand, which possibly can cause uh, damage. And finally, one way to reduce the hoop effective tensile stress, which uh, potentially can cause damage, is by um, reducing uh, the, the temperature and also reducing the pressure of the injected uh, uh, CO2. However, reducing the temperature can cause, as we mentioned, uh, uh, stress relief and potential fracturing and uh, negative pore water pressure on the wellbore uh, formation. Uh, to sum up, this is some uh, project outputs. Uh, we have already published um, three conference papers and one general uh, paper uh, at well-known conferences. And um, the experimental results in UCS interactional tests are being submitted to the general rock mechanics and rock engineering. And another two general papers are being uh, prepared and um, uh, will be published soon in um, uh, some journals as the numerical and analytical methods in the Journal of Rock Mechanics and Mining Sciences. Uh, thanks a lot for um, uh, your time. Uh, any questions? Awesome. Thank you very much, Nikolaus. Um, OK, anybody got any questions? Feel free to put your hand up. I will skim. Uh, ben Stewart's also got put a couple of questions in the chat that I can read out. My Zoom has just freaked out, bear with me. Um, okay, I'll start off with, with Ben's first question. Um, so with respect to the project decision-making, what did you use um, as your definition of permanent storage? Is Nicolaus still there?
I think he's frozen for me too. Uh, yeah. Um, well, we can ponder that for a minute to see if he can rejoin. If not, we've got Ben's second question. If if he can get back in, we've also got a question from Simon as well as a second one from Ben. We'll give him. Sorry, I have a Wi-Fi issue problem. Ah, no, Wi-Fi. no problem. Wi-Fi, yeah, no problem. Did you catch that first question? Or yeah, yeah. So uh, when we, when we talk about uh, permanent storage, it means that uh, we can safely store the CO two underground. Uh, until a certain capacity of the of the rock, the formation that exists there. So it it from different papers that are already published in research, it shows that for the next 15 years we have the capacity to store some CO2. So we can help to achieve that net zero goal by 2050. Cool. Just in the interest of being fair, I know you've got a second question, Ben, but Simon Price has also got their hand up. So I'm just going to let Simon ask their question. And then if we have time, we can squeeze in your second one. And yeah, if not, Nicholas can uh, reply to you directly in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Just a really quick one. It's a, a new topic for me, this. So I appreciate your your talk and I've learned loads already. Um, I just wondered about the freezing conditions. Are they Are they important? So the rate that the rock is cooled, for example, is that an important factor in this process or is it all to do with the kind of injectivity of the of, of carbon dioxide? Yeah, uh, that, that's quite a good question. I didn't have a lot of time to explain. So the first thing is when we inject from pipeline, one effect can be due to Joule Thompson effect that the CO2 can expand at the wellbore, inside the wellbore, and the temperature can drop. And that drop can be the temperature difference between the wellbore formation and the actual liquid CO2. And the other way, which it's uh, of high importance, is when we inject from sieps, because the CO2 at the sieve is being kept at minus 50 degrees, and 07 MPA, which is the super critical, uh, sorry, which is the triple point of the CO2 uh, at the phase diagram. Uh, when we want to inject it, we usually heat it up at 4.5 degrees or the seabed uh, temperature. But in order to avoid that thing and don't spend energy to heat it up, we can inject at lower temperatures. And lower temperature means that they can freeze the rock nearby, they can freeze. Um, uh, the wellbore formation, and this can cause all the damage effects. I hope I make a bit clear what I mean about it's important because we can save money by not heating up the CO2 when it's being injected from SIPs and also save energy from that. That's perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Nicolaus. Ben, just in the interest of time, would you mind asking... Nicolaus, or taking it offline just so we keep running to time. Your second question is that okay? Cool. Right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Nicolaus, thanks, very much. So, our final talk before we have a short break is from Guy Finkel at the Tyndall Centre at the University of Manchester. And, and Guy is going to talk to us about governing residual emissions and the decarbonisation of the UK industrial clusters. So, take it away, Guy, when you are ready. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. Two seconds. Just going to think. There we go. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, uh, as Chris said, yeah, I'm Guy. I'm at the Tyndall Centre at the University of Manchester. Uh, and here I'm going to provide an overview of my planned PhD research strategy that dives into the thorny issue of governing residual emissions in the decarbonisation of UK's industrial clusters. So, in this presentation, we'll cover off uh, some background context for the study, looking at some of the principal actors involved the overall relevance of the study, uh, and then a brief overview of the proposed uh, publications uh, to answer the, the research questions. And here we've just got a snapshot of the facilities, which are the primary emitters dotted around Teesside that are incorporated into the East Coast Clusters decarbonisation plans. It gives kind of a handy overview of the complexity involved in these types of shared infrastructural decarbonisation plans. Yeah, and by the look of the speakers today, I think I'm going to be the, the light social science uh, relief for today's talks. Um, yeah, so a bit of background. Um, so according to the UK's net zero strategy published uh, late 2021, the UK's manufacturing and refining sector, i.e. industry, uh, contributes £180 billion to the overall economy, directly accounting for 8% of GDP, while providing 2.5 million direct jobs across the country, as well as, as, well as contributing to over uh, 5 million across the entirety of the value chain. However, 
industry, as we know, is obviously a major source of CO2 emissions, producing 15% of the UK's total at the time of publication, uh, which translates to about 78 megatons of CO2 equivalent. Um, yeah, and around half of industrial emissions are concentrated in specific clusters, i.e. geographical areas with large concentrations of industry. So these clusters are a natural choice to pick for ramping up and kind of speeding up the rate of decarbonisation. Um, and industrial emissions in the UK have more than halved since 1990, due mainly to the changing structure of the UK's manufacturing sector, due to uh, things such as improved energy efficiency, a shift to fuels with a lower emissions intensity, uh, etc. But despite this progress, the overall pace of reductions is slowing, and more action is obviously needed to achieve the, the net zero commitments of the, of the UK. So herein kind of lies the real crux of the, that the pace of reduction is integrally important um, as the more unabated emissions stemming from industry in the years leading up to 2050, the higher the likelihood of overshooting carbon budgets, reaching temperature thresholds and the like. And thus the UK government have turned their attention to decarbonizing uh, these clusters with a host of programs and incentives to accelerate the process. Um, and in light of that, my, for my re research, I'm focusing on the clusters that have been named in the UK's cluster sequencing process for carbon capture usage and storage deployment, i.e. CCUS, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. Um, and this program would be providing funding and support to help develop CCUS clusters across the country. And my research is going to hone in on the implementation of this clustering process, um, which is embracing various forms of removals, which uh, still, quite, still remain quite ambiguously defined. I'm going to be looking at things like build-out rates, capturing capacity, feedstock supply, um, and the end use of captured emissions, and keeping a persistent eye on what these variances might mean for the level of unabated emissions, sorry, unabated emissions in the near term and residual emissions in the in the future. So as part of this research, we need to have a look at what's getting reconfigured in the clusters, so to say. So I'm going to be having a look at the engineered forms of greenhouse gas removal that are located or connected to these clusters as have been earmarked in the, the cluster sequencing process. So some of the examples of removals which are detailed in this figure here, which I've uh, nicked from the, the Climate Change Com uh, Committee's six carbon budget report, uh, we can see things like uh, BECs for the purpose of uh, multiple outputs, such as BECs to power, to hydrogen, biofuels, manufacturing, con construction, and so forth. You'll notice here that carbon capture utilization um, is not um, within the figure, and it kind of still remains in this liminal gray area with some classifying it as a removal, whereas others do not. And yeah, as, it, as you can see, CCC are not including it on this one. So back to the, the cluster sequencing process and just to provide, provide a bit more context. Here are the two clusters which are uh, named in track one of the cluster sequencing process um, that were confirmed in 2021. Uh, it's highly likely that the Scottish cluster, including the chemicals park in Grangemouth, will be the named in the next stage of the process, um, as it was the reserve cluster for, for track one. So yeah, so here we've got uh, a little overview of some of the companies that have had their projects and facilities shortlisted to proceed to the due diligence stage of the phase two of the cluster sequencing process. And there's a total of 20 projects uh, represented here by these different companies. Um, the projects are mainly related to enabling uh, low carbon power generation to supply energy for these clusters, uh, substantial ramped up uh, hydrogen uh, production, and also clustered facilities that will be fitted with uh, carbon capture capacity, uh, both retro retrofitted facilities and greenfield uh, sites, where their CO2 can either be destined for long term storage or rerouted towards carbon to value uh, products. Uh, as of yet, I haven't completed the individual facility research yet to see what that divide looks like between CCS and CCU across these different projects, um, as these are some of the next few steps of the, the quantitative research. So this is kind of what's happening on the ground, uh, so to speak, um, with the first steps being made in regards to um, industrial greenhouse gas removal potential being greenlit and, and brought online. But the manner in how these studied uh, clusters kind of embark on this low carbon transition kind of holds multiple variances and a, a host of uncertainties. Um, this range of variances can translate into a range of outcomes uh, related to abated or unabated emissions, and ultimately that can have an effect on, on temperature outcomes. So this is especially pertinent if the UK is truly at the vanguard of industrial decarbonisation, which it claims to be, um, as it can act as a prototype model to be followed by other countries that share the same or similar climate commitments. Uh, this image here just shows the uh, CO2 equivalent um, per annum emissions per cluster, Note that only the three in the centre uh, are currently earmarked for the UK's cluster sequencing process, but the, the Scottish cluster was in reserve for track one, as I mentioned, 
So will probably be announced uh, later this year. This figure here is taken from a 2021 World Economic uh, Forum report on energy transition. Apologies if the quantities are, are slightly out now. I'm sure you guys have probably got more up-to-date figures than, than I do. Uh, so yeah, so here I have the three core research questions that will look to guide the analysis of this low carbon transition. Firstly, uh, how are stakeholders involved in the decarbonisation of the UK's clusters, considering the issue of firstly, cumulative unabated emissions before 2050? And secondly, uh, the residual emissions at the point of net zero realisation and after that, which will be 2050. Um, given the variety of low carbon transition pathways for these clusters and thus UK industry as a whole, what are the carbon budget and just transition implications on just a nationwide level concerning the unabated industrial emissions on the, the path towards net zero realisation? And finally, considering these distinct low carbon transition pathways, which are available, what are the much wider global climate justice implications of the UK's cumulative uh, unabated emissions and their removal capacities um, as have been detailed in the, the net zero strategies uh, pathways um, and the, the scenarios involved in the, the CB6. So to be able to articulate answers to these research questions, I plan to bring out four publications addressing uh, different components of uh, the clusters transition. Here I'll go through each of these publications individually detailing what the core focus will be in each one and how it relates to a, a climate justice thread that will be woven through all of the publications. So first of all, we've got the Overton window or the, the policy window as it could be named. Uh, this publication will plot the discursive drivers at play uh, within UK policymaking related to GGR implementation as part of the ongoing cluster sequencing process. This paper kind of sets the stage for the, the research from a qualitative perspective as the mapping of the prevalent discourses in GDR policymaking within the UK context can give a, an indication of how governments perceive the contrasting roles of emissions removals alongside uh, non-permanent forms of emissions abatement, such as uh, CCU and CCS um, of non-biogenic uh, combustion, uh, potentially drawing attention to the, the limitations of net emission reductions, which can be achieved through, through CCU. Um, the data for this paper will be a combination of government publications, um, and they'll be backed up by semi-structured interviews with relevant public and corporate stakeholders. And from a, from a climate justice perspective, the paper will be highlighting a variety of impacts that are likely to arise, depending where the Overton window uh, can be mapped on this particular figure. Okay, bit of a different thread here. Second publication is gonna be about green bonds, um, looking to shed light on the finance flows that are connected to the financing of these clusters. Um, an issue which is quite overlooked in this, this realm of research. Um, so I'm going to be evaluating the use of proceeds from relevant uh, green bonds, um, as it may indicate how the market is responding to the emergent need of rapid decarbonisation of these uh, industrial practices. So there'll be an, an analysis of the varying shades of green found in the, these green bonds, um, which may open up further questions speaking to matters of residual emissions and the potential for carbon lock-in. And uh, from a climate justice perspective, similar to the previous paper, um, going to be highlighting what the repercussions may be for if the financing is directed more towards the incremental reform of uh, existing facilities, uh, rather than being used for more transformational architectural type, type changes. Thirdly, we have a, a quantifying residuals publication. Uh, this will be providing the, the, bulks, uh, the bulk of the empirics of the, the PhD research. So it'll lay the basis uh, for understanding the extent of abatement measures being implemented as part of the, the cluster sequencing process. And so by studying the intricacies of the named facilities uh, in the process, it will be possible to see what proportion of emissions are being sought to be abated through measures of emissions reductions versus uh, rem being removed via a portfolio of, uh, of GGR. Uh, it can also shed light on the current technology readiness level um, of the particular facilities and clusters in question. Uh, yeah, from a climate justice perspective, this paper will lay the groundwork for the following paper uh, by drawing attention to the local and global impacts of cumulative unabated emissions being kind of planned for and scheduled into decarbonisation uh, roadmaps and strategies, obviously in reference to uh, industrial emissions. Uh, this figure just shows the CO2 point sources and their, and their clustering, it's taken from a 2018 paper. Yeah, finally, we have a, a governing residuals publication. Uh, this is going to have a a strong focus on the topic of common but differentiated responsibility and the respective capacity to act upon that, uh, commonly known as CBDRRC uh, in climate governance circles. And so 
the manner in which the assessed industrial clusters are reconfigured or reoriented uh, will, um, sorry, as they pursue their decarbonisation commitments, will depend heavily on the overarching policy architecture. Uh, the governance trends of decarbonising industry that get initiated by the incumbent regime right now in the 2020s, so the Conservative Party as we speak, um, will make significant contributions to the likelihood of how reliant uh, this and future governments will be on both natural and technological forms of GGR um, going on into the latter half of the 21st century, and even other forms of uh, climate engineering such as uh, solar, solar radiation management. Uh, this paper will bring forward findings that are of particular relevance to policymakers uh, that are tasked with the management and regulation of decarbonizing these, these clusters and industry as a whole. So the common thread that I would like to maintain throughout these publications is, of course, uh, unabated and residual emissions, their, their management and potential mismanagement, both now and in the future, and what the implications will be for both climate governance and, and climate justice, as these are underlying notions that form the contextual backbone of the research. Uh, and thus are prevalent across the publications. Uh, this will include evaluations of governance, technological assuredness, as well as appropriate and responsible financing. So the governance of the cluster's reconfiguration away from its inherently high emitting practices um, can follow several avenues that will contain a host of variances in the quantity of cumulative unabated emissions um, from industry as they follow their path to net zero as well as the amount of nagging residual emissions on the supposed point of net zero realization. These variances in, uh, in emissions levels can have significant ramifications on not just atmospheric concentrations of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, but will also have consequences on a socio-political uh, level. So really I'm looking to get to dig into the nitty gritty of the UK's cluster sequencing process as a quite a, um, comprehensive analysis on how this low carbon transition is looking to, to, to manifest and how it's uh, taking shape. And yeah, I just got a couple of take home messages. So hitting net zero and in the long run, perhaps even net negative emissions is obviously the goal here. Um, but there are a variety of pathways and impacts, uh, sorry, a, no, a variety of pathways towards that goal, uh, each of which will have different consequences and impacts across a range of stakeholders and of course, the climate. And decarbonizing industry is just one facet of the UK's commitment to hit net zero. But what we learn from um, the industry's reconfiguration in the UK could be integral to understanding how other sectors and geographies look to be tackling the thorny issue of hard to abate emissions. And the, abra the embrace or the reliance on forms of CCS or CCU will have significant consequences on the level of uh, emissions in the current and coming decades, and thus uh, the carbon budget, carbon budget management and uh, potential for temperature overshoot. Thanks, uh, yeah, so much for listening and welcoming feedback, questions, comments, etc. Awesome, thanks, Guy. And I think in uh, in lieu of your talk, we're all looking forward to hearing some more about the clustering in the government spring statement next week, of course. So, um, yeah, hopefully, lots of details will be in there. So, we got a couple of questions, uh, a few questions in the chat. Um, also, I'm maybe going to start with with Joe, who I know came to it last in terms of questions, just because Joe hasn't asked a question so far. Um, so, Joe, if you want to unmute, and then we'll we'll combine Ben and Steve's questions just before the break. Oh, you're, you're very generous in bringing me on, on first. Um, great paper. Thank you very much for your presentations. Just a number of comments rather than perhaps a specific question. Just wondering whether or not in your work you've considered some of the international agenda around this, particularly the Inflation Reduction Act and the impl implications of the Inflation Reduction Act on some of the work that you're doing here and on the clusters. Secondly, I'm wondering whether or not, and this isn't a question for you, I'm wondering whether you uh, you considered the sort of different phases of the planning application process. So the comprehensive development order vis-a-vis -vis specific site applications for carbon capture. Um, third, thirdly, I'm wondering whether or not you've looked at site-specific aspects of the track one, phase two aspects of, of, of the industrial decarbonisation challenge as well. So a whole series of different things there to, to consider. Oh, and finally, in relation to the Northwest cluster, bear in mind that we also have the country's largest carbon capture and utilisation facility. It's not part of the high net uh, partnership or cluster per se, but the Tata Chemicals site in Northwich did receive significant funding for a carbon capture and utilisation facility that's now operational. 
Happy to discuss that with you, any of that information with you further, should you wish, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm taking a personal interest in the, the Inflation Reduction Act, but it won't be yeah, um, playing such a, a role in my own research. It, um, when I started just over a year ago in this, I was looking at uh, the entirety of the, the facilities neighbouring the North Sea. Um, but I've uh, since then reduced the the scope of the of the research to just be looking at the the UK's cluster sequencing sequencing process, and um, mostly just because it's uh, it's further along um, in comparison than than a lot of the other um, incentives and programs from a from a state perspective um, from the other North Sea neighbouring countries. Um, in regards to the other comments, um, yeah, I'm having a look at. Um, the different rounds of licensing with the, the NSTA and um, having a look at um, the intricacies of each facility, which has been, um, yeah, deemed eligible and now shortlisted for uh, for the track one um, of the uh, yeah track one phase two of the of the sequencing process. And so that's yeah kind of the next steps of uh, of my research. And I think there was one other thing you you mentioned, but I think I've forgotten that now. So, oh, yeah. so the other dimension that I mentioned was the CCU facility within the Northwest as well, over at Northwich with the Tata Chemicals facility. I think right. that's a really interesting one in terms of carbon capture and utilisation, uh, capturing the carbon there and, and mixing it with the salt to make sodium bicarbonate. Really quite expensive, I think, but uh, well worthy of considering it as opposed to the whole carbon capture carbon mm. transport and carbon storage proposition that's the ccu proposition that's emerging within the northwest yeah yeah just, I'd, I'd be to, just to, to in the interest well. of time and fairness if i just yeah. squeeze in steve's point about our question about carbon pricing if you want to speak, speak anything to that guy and then we'll take a, a 10 minute break before we go on to our next speaker and sorry again ben feel free to pick pick up the stuff offline just trying to give everybody a chance to ask a question uh, yeah, so this is something I've, um, I'm looking to, to bear in mind going forward, especially on my second paper, which is going to be having a look at the um, the finance flows uh, going into the uh, industrial clusters. Yeah, as of course, carbon pricing is going to make um, play a massive role in in the way that the market uh, responds to the need for yeah raising rapid uh, amounts of and huge amounts of capital uh, for this kind of reorientation of uh, of heavy industry. Um, so yeah, that is going to um, play a large role. I've um, I did a, a bit of research for the UN over the last couple of years, looking into the um, the role of um, both public and corporate financing in the in the petrochemical uh, industry, and that was uh, really useful for getting a yeah just a, an overall look at how this, the market can respond to these uh, these high emitting practices and how it can also be used as um, a point of leverage for for trying to, to turn the tide, as it as it were. But yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much again, Guy, and all the questioners so far. Um, um, we are now moving on to Sikui Wang from Cranfield University. And Sikui is going to speak to us about biorefinery, uh, sorry, um, biometallic nickel based catalysts for sorption enhanced steam methane reforming. So when you are ready, Sikui, take it away. Thank you, Chris. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Sikui, and I'm a PhD student in the energy and sustainability theme at Cranfield University. So uh, today I'll be presenting a section of my research, which is about biometallic nickel-based catalysts for sorption enhanced steam methane reforming. Um, so firstly, I want to start with a brief introduction to the SESMR process. Um, as we all know, um, hydrogen is uh, gaining uh, increasing attention as a clean alternative to fossil fuels. And currently the most uh, commercialized technology for hydrogen production is by steam methane reforming, SMR. And um, this process is in general coupled with a uh, post-reaction CCS step to eliminate the CO2 produced. And um, a novel technology called SESMR is currently under development. And uh, this process integrates the conventional SMR process with an uh, in-situ CO2 capture step where we use a solid CO2 sorbent um, to capture CO2 as the SMR reaction takes place. And this enables the production of low carbon and nearly uh, pure hydrogen. And um, one problem with this process is that um, 
the process needs a catalyst to take to take place. And the currently um, commercially available nickel-based catalysts uh, have um, problems such as uh, sintering and uh, deactivation due to uh, carbon or sulfur deposition. So one way to mitigate this problem is by adding a different type of metal and enhance its uh, overall performance. Um, noble metals ha have been shown to be very, um, very positive, but they are also limited by their uh, high prices. So uh, it is of interest to look at non-noble metal-based materials such as nickel, iron, copper, uh, cobalt, or copper. And uh, in the aim of achieving a comparable result as uh, nickel and noble metal based materials. Um, so the aim of my research is to investigate the performance of low cost bi and trimetallic catalysts for both SMR and SASMR processes. Uh, in order to achieve this aim, uh, the first step will be to uh, select the ones that are um, interesting for future testing. And we know that there ex exist uh, hundreds and thousands of different combinations of uh, bimetallic materials. And uh, in order to do this, we uh, numerically predicted uh, the catalytic activity of um, common bimetallic materials. And the ones that are uh, selected to have high activity are then synthesized, characterized, and uh, tested under lab cell conditions. And, uh, after evaluating their catalytic performance, we also looked at the stability of uh, these materials, but uh, this is not relevant to CCS, so I will not cover this in this presentation. Um, so starting with the first objective, um, we want to know uh, what the activity of the materials are. So with the help of uh, DFT calculations and um, microkinetic modeling based on the reaction mechanisms of the processes, we obtained uh, this counterplot uh, where the catalytic activity of any given material is represented by the carbon and oxygen absorption energies on the material surface. Uh, this, the part uh, colored in red in the central area represents the highest activity. And if we zoom in, we can see that um, commonly used materials such as nickel, rhodium, and ruthenium are predicted to have the highest activity. Uh, after obtaining the counterplot, we then plotted um, over 100 different uh, bimetallic alloys uh, represented by the blue dots on the graph. And uh, we can see that um, nickel-based materials such as uh, nickel alloyed with germanium, arsenic, uh, antimony, copper, and iron were predicted to have the highest activity. Uh, in this work, uh, we focused mainly on nickel copper based materials uh, as nickel is cheap, uh, sorry, as copper is cheap, uh, readily available, and non toxic. Um, so, after selecting the, the material of interest, we then used um, uh, the, the rig uh, shown in this picture for the experimental, experimental testing. Um, so the methane uh, inlet stream comes from a gas cylinder, whereas the steam comes from a steam generator controlled by an HPLC pump. And the main reactions uh, take place in a fixed bed reactor, and the outlet gases are uh, recorded and analyzed by the gas analyzers. Uh, the materials that we tested were alumina supported nickel catalyst and uh, bimetallic nickel copper materials with different nickel to copper ratio. And they were synthesized by the um, easy and conventional wet impregnation method. Uh, for the SMR process where no carbon capture takes place, uh, we used one layer of catalyst fixed by uh, quartz wool. And for the SESMR process, we added a, uh, an additional layer of sorbent in the form of uh, limestone particles in, with size in the range of uh, 300 to 400 microns. And uh, before starting the main reactions, uh, we first calcine the limestone at 850 degrees while activating the catalyst uh, with hydrogen at the same time. Um, the performance of uh, the catalyst itself was evaluated based on uh, methane conversion, which is defined by uh, the amount of methane consumed during the rea reaction. And uh, the overall performance of uh, the combination of sorbent plus catalyst 
uh, was evaluated using the purity of hydrogen in um, the outlet gas stream. Um, so uh, the results from uh, the experiments are presented here. So in the figure on the left-hand side, uh, the methane conversion is plotted against temperature and uh, the black crosses represents the thermodynamic equilibrium of the SMR reaction. Um, so as we can see at lower temperatures, such as uh, 600 degrees, um, the monometallic nickel material um, has a significantly higher reaction than the bimetallic materials. Uh, however, as the temperature increases, um, the bimetallic materials reached a um, similar amount uh, of methane conversion, and they eventually outperformed uh, the monometallic nickel. Um, so one uh, possible explanation for this is that uh, pure copper has been uh, proven to be a good catalyst for the water gas shift reaction, uh, which, uh, as you can see on the top right um, corner of this slide, um, this water gas shift reaction takes place simultaneously with steam methane reforming. And uh, in the presence of copper, uh, the carbon monoxide produced uh, by the reaction is transformed to CO2. And therefore, uh, the equilibrium moves towards the di direction of uh, more hydrogen production. Also, if we compare uh, the green and red triangles, uh, which are uh, nickel copper with uh, uh, molar ratios of three to one and one to one, we can see that they um, have a similar level of methane conversion. Um, this is uh, very interesting from an, uh, an economic point of view because um, the cost of copper is lower than nickel. And based on this result, um, with a minimum um, nickel amount of 50%, we were able to achieve a, a comparable level of uh, catalytic activity and um, even, uh, well, even a better activity if we use only nickel for this reaction. Um, for the figure on the right-hand side, uh, methane conversion is plotted against temperature for the SESMR process. Um, uh, if we compare this with the, with the previous results, we can see that by adding, a, uh, by adding an additional CO2 capture step, uh, the methane conversion can uh, be significantly increased. Uh, however, if we compare um, uh, the methane conversion for the bimetallic material at 700 degrees, we can see that uh, the increase is not as significant as uh, it was for the monometallic nickel material. Um, we don't have a uh, final conclusion as to why uh, the CO2 sorbent um, does not have a um, significant effect on the bimetallic material um, because the work is still in progress and uh, we would like to uh, finish the current um, experiments and uh, do some uh, necessary repetitions uh, to eliminate any experimental errors before we um, investigate uh, the effect of uh, sorbent on the bimetallic material. And uh, moving on to the hydrogen purity uh, produced uh, by the reactions. Here we present uh, hydrogen purity for different temperatures for both uh, uh, SMR reaction represented by the triangles and the SESMR reaction represented uh, by the circles. So uh, the first thing that we can see is that the addition of the sorbent uh, increased the hydrogen purity, which is um, as expected as it is the objective of adding the sorbent. Uh, but we also saw that the addition of copper can increase uh, hydrogen purity by around 10% under SESMR uh, conditions. Um, this is also uh, possibly due to the uh, promoting fact of copper on the water gas shift reaction as uh, presented previously. Um, in the presence of copper, uh, more carbon monoxide is being uh, transformed to carbon dioxide. And with the uh, presence of the CO2 sorbent, we were able to capture the CO2 and therefore increasing uh, the, the purity of the hydrogen that we produce. Uh, however, uh, in contrast to the methane conversion, which increases with temperature, here we see that hydrogen purity 
uh, decreases as temperature rises because uh, carbonation is an exothermic reaction. So um, in order to achieve a, um, a, an optimal overall performance, uh, we need to find a balance between, uh, between the high uh, methane conversion and high hydrogen purity. So it is necessary to um, compare these two results and uh, decide on an optimal temperature for the SESMR uh, process. So to conclude my presentation, um, a series of uh, bimetallic nickel copper materials were, uh, were investigated and among which nickel three, copper one and nickel one, copper one produced the optimal results. Um, the, the addition of copper improved methane conversion and the promoting effect is uh, most significant at higher temperatures. Um, the addition of copper is also able to improve hydrogen purity and a high, highest um, level of 96% can be achieved under SESMR conditions. Um, uh, the application of the bimetallic material uh, is of interest because it can potentially reduce production cost. Uh, but currently, uh, we only have an estimation based on the raw materials used to synthesize the, uh, the, the, the catalyst. And a um, more detailed um, techno-economic analysis is required in order to um, investigate the, the production costs for these materials at a larger scale. And uh, finally, by adding uh, calcium oxide as the CO2 sorbent, both methane conversion and hydrogen purity can be improved. However, this effect is most favorable at lower temperatures. So the final um, overall performance will be a trade-off between the high methane conversion and a high hydrogen purity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Super interesting, thanks. <laughs> okay, anybody have any questions? Again, feel free to put your hand up. Uh, we have a couple in the chat already. So we've got one from Harry. Um, I yes. don't know if you can see it. I'll read it out just in yeah, case yeah. anybody can't. So is there any carbon depo depositions on the catalyst during your SESMR tests? Um, yes, but only a small amount. So for uh, the pure nickel catalyst, there's around 10% um, 10%, uh, 10 uh, weight percentage of carbon deposition on the material. But a, I think a more serious problem with uh, the pure nickel material is uh, the sintering at higher temperatures. But for uh, the bimetallic material, um, uh, the, um, uh, the amount of carbon deposition can almost be neg neglected because uh, we only, um, we, we did a reaction for only 10 to 15 minutes. So the carbon deposition is not a very serious, does not have a very serious effect on the, the material. But uh, if we um, continue the, the, the test and do it for a longer period of time, then yes, I think carbon deposition will, will increase in this case. Great, thanks. Hopefully that, yeah. Thank you, says Harry. <laughs> um, and I've also got a question from Ben, and I'm not gonna cut you off this, bit, this time, Ben. So how does Indonesian prohibition of nickel or e export affect your economics? Um, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I have no idea, to be honest, because I'm looking at um, the, well, the, the technical side rather than the economic side. So, sorry, I don't know the answer to this question. That's okay. Nobody has all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more questions? We've got a couple of minutes spare. So, any burning questions, feel free to stick your hand up. If not, we, we can move on. Um, I'll give it a minute or so. Okay, it doesn't look like anybody has, but thank you again for that, that yeah. really interesting talk. Um, and with that, we move on to our, our final speaker for the day. So um, Louis Rodriguez from the University of Glasgow is going to sp speak to us about biorefineries and Bex. So, Louis, when you're ready, um, feel free to share your screen and slides and, and take it away. And oh, just, to add, just to add, just to add, Louis, because um, you, I don't think you were here at the start. I will turn my 
video back on with two minute when you've got two minutes left for your speaking. Okay, no, that's no problem. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep, that's perfect. Uh, okay, that's it. So, hello everybody. I'm Luis Rodriguez. Uh, I'm a, a visiting researcher at the University of Glasgow and a PhD student in the PhD program in bioenergy in Brazil. And today I present to you a little bit about my research uh, and the context in which my research is inserted, okay? So that's our agenda for today. So uh, you start with the project's motivation, uh, then uh, the project itself, so some preliminary results, and finally the conclusion. So, okay, just a second. Yeah. So according to the human influence on the climate system report, it's inequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, land and ocean since pre-industrial times. And it's also known that uh, the probability of uh, harmful uh, climate change effects uh, increases with the growing temperature. So um, to minimize these outcomes, uh, the, inter uh, the, the international community defined in COP21, 2015, a limit of two deg degrees of safe global temperature increase, but with an effort to, uh, to contain it to 1.5 degrees uh, by, uh, of course, by uh, 2100 uh, and take into account uh, pre-industrial levels. So this increase in temperature is strongly related to, to human interference on biosphere, especially greenhouse gas emissions with CO2 as the main GVG as we know. So let's talk about a little bit of uh, about actually uh, CO2. Here on the right, uh, on the right uh, chart taken from NOAA, uh, we, we can see that we are experiencing the highest CO2 concentrations in 800,000 years. And on the chart on your left uh, is a figure taken from the Summer of Four Policymakers by IPCC 2021. Uh, the black lines uh, is the black line actually is the cumulative CO2 emissions uh, against the global surface temperature increase from 1850s to uh, 2019. And the colorful ones are projections from 2020 to 2050. Uh, okay. We in, we can see here that uh, the, there's kind of a near linear relationship between uh, CO2 concentration and uh, global temperature increase. So uh, if one of the problems is the high CO2 concentration, why do if we capture CO2 directly from, from the atmosphere? So, okay, uh, well, this is a theoretical scheme of a carbon capture machine. Uh, that we use to calculate the minimal uh, energy to restore the atmosphere to pre-industrial levels, taking into account uh, uh, CO2, okay, CO2. So all the, the calculations were based on the second law of thermodynamics with isothermal uh, and reversible processes. It basically takes uh, and separates CO2 from the atmosphere then it compresses CO2 to mainly produce supercritical CO2, which is suitable for geological storage. Uh, to do that, to restore the atmosphere, uh, it would be needed 226, almost that, uh, billion megawatt hour. And it would represent something like 16 months of global society's primary energy consumption regarding levels of two, uh, 2021 and seven, uh, 755 kilojoules of energy per uh, kilogram of uh, captured CO2 in this scenario. So that's really important to highlight. That's the bottom line. So I can spend less than this energy uh, in this configuration right here. 
Fortunately, there are other ways of capturing CO2 and, and nature can help us. Uh, plants and other organisms that perform photosynthesis naturally uh, uh, capture CO2 and we can take advantage of it. So again, this figure right here, um, SSP1 to 1.9 and SSP1 to 2.6 are the only ones that are adequate with the, the safe global temperature increase. And they consider in their, in their projections some negative emission technologies that are able of capturing and storing the atmospheric CO2. So uh, biorefineries, which are uh, industrial plants that processes biomass, uh, might play an important role in this scenario by implementing these negative emission technologies and becoming BECs, which stands for bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. So now the question is, how much does this system, this, uh, the, the carbon capture system, cost to the industry, environment, and energy-wise? To answer this question, uh, we define our project's goal as determining the exegetic and environment impacts of a CCS system on a reference Brazilian biorefinery, assessing the, uh, I want to write like this one, the potential of carbon dioxide sequestration and uh, the variance of stochastic industrial controllable parameters. I will come back to them uh, in the next slides, okay? But for now, we've been modeling a sugarcane biorefinery that processed 500 tons of sugarcane stocks uh, per hour and 75 tons of straw uh, per hour. And it produces sugar, ethanol, electricity, and supercritical CO2, CO2 sorry, which is again suitable for geological storage. Uh, lately at the University of, of Glasgow, uh, material energy flows of the agriculture and transport phases have been considered and a life cycle assessment will be performed to calculate the carbon footprint of the entire system, taking into account uh, the industrial phase as well. So, okay, we have here our cradle to, to gate uh, model. It begins with the sugarcane plantation, then the harvesting and transportation of sugarcane and straw. Those are the subsistence of the agriculture, oh, sorry, the agriculture and transport phases. And then the, the, the straw is unbailed and is mechanical processes, processes uh, process as well, uh, like cleaned and, uh, and shattered to enter the industrial phase. And uh, on the other side, sugarcane here is also mechanically processed to mainly produce big ass and uh, raw juice. This raw juice uh, is treated to, to go to the, the sugar production and to produce sugar and to the ethanol production as well. Uh, Vinas, which is a residue from the, from the ethanol production, is an anaerobic di digested to mainly produce a biogas, which is used to generate uh, heat and electricity to the industry and to the grid by the power cycle unit. And here, the gas and straw can both go to the second generation ethanol production to increase the ethanol yield, or, or and they can both go to the power cycle unit to generate heat and uh, electricity, okay? Last but not least, our oxycombustion carbon capture system, which uh, is composed of uh, air separation unit to mainly separate uh, oxygen from the air. Um, this oxygen goes to uh, the oxycombustion system uh, and the big gas and straw is combusted in a uh, uh, O2 enriched air uh, to, you know, to, to produce the flue gases and the flue gases exchange uh, heat with the power cycles, then this, these uh, flue gases are dewatered and compressed to mainly produce 
uh, supercritical CO2. Okay, so now we have here our controllable and uncontrollable stochastic parameters. So the, the bluish elements are the controllable parameters and it's defined as the, the parameters that the operator of the industry are capable uh, is capable actually uh, to control. So one one example of it is the percentage of sugar cane, uh, sorry of baguettes and straw that goes to the power cycle to produce uh, heat and energy, heat and uh, sorry heat and electricity, and their complement uh, goes to the second uh, generation ethanol production. Uh, uh, on the other one, on the other hand, we have here uh, our stochastic uh, parameters that uh, our operator uh, doesn't have any control of them, uh, such as sugarcane composition uh, or composition of straw, like the percentage of water in straw or percentage of fiber and so on. So it's worth mentioning that uh, this sugarcane uh, is the sugarcane model, the sugarcane biofinery model, uh, actually, is modeled entirely in Python, and the code will be uh, will be published on my GitHub page as soon as possible. Okay, and we've also have been performing balances of mass, energy, and exergy uh, in the industrial phase uh, regarding these parameters. Uh, to mainly calculate the production of sugar, ethanol, electricity, and to calculate as well carbon capture potential. Okay, so the results, actually, the result of these balances is the 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 operational envelope, and it will be constructed by Monte Carlo simulations through randomly choosing uh, the parameters. And again, the life cycle assessment will be performed to calculate. Uh, the entire carbon footprint of the system, and it really allows us to 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 uh, to calculate as well the carbon capture potential, which uh, we define as the difference between the amount of CO two that's captured by the system and the its carbon footprint uh, calculated uh, through the life cycle assessment, and then. Uh, this model will undergo a uh, optimization procedure, which is a multi-objective uh, optimization with these four objectives, sugar, ethanol, electricity, and carbon capture potential. In the preliminary results, uh, we're going to compare the, um, the direct capturing of CO2 with our ideal model, okay? So uh, we did that by by picking up a uh, 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 controllable parameter, in this case, is the fraction of the minimum work of separation, uh, of oxygen separation that powers the, their uh, separation unit. Okay, so we got our optimal state, and we could uh, capture 0 0.32 kilos of CO2 per one kilo of uh, processed material, which are uh, sugarcane and straw. And we will expand something like 471.88 kilojoules uh, per one kilo of captured CO2, which is way less than 755 kilojoules per kilogram. So we have this, uh, this room for improvement, okay? Therefore, the, the potential and uh, the importance of the, 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 the system is that you can add this configuration okay, to other biorefineries that process other kinds of, of biomass, such as corn, uh, eucalypt, eucalyptus, and so on. And the code is already prepared uh, to receive, to accept uh, other legal symbolic materials. Okay? Another thing is that we, uh, with these balances and the multi objective optimization with uh, life cycle assessment, uh, we could see them as, as a kind of framework to other biorefineries as well, because uh, it takes into account not only the amount of CO2 that's captured by the system, but also the carbon capture 
potential uh, and it considers of course the carbon uh, footprint of the industry of the system as well and all their uh, products or valuable products that this type of biorefinery can deliver to society uh, such as uh, biochemicals and energy vectors like ethanol and uh, electricity so uh, I would like to thank UKCCSRS RC uh, for the opportunity to present to you and for your time as well. Uh, those are my contact infos. Feel free to send me uh, a message if you want. And thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you, Louis. Um, you have already a couple of questions in the chat. Anybody else has a question, feel free to add it into the chat or stick your hand up. So first, you have a question from Daniel Mullen, who is ask, asking, um, when you were doing the calculations at the start for DAC or removals, what was the cap CO2 capture rate that was assumed in the outlet of the DAC machine? So DAC being direct air capture. For anyone uh, so uh, of this actually is like a uh, the minimal work of separation. So uh, it's uh, completely ideal uh, work of separation. So there's no such a thing as efficiency or, or I, I, what, I, what I did is I, uh, there's like, I, I did a exergy balance on this kind of system, uh, considering a, a exergy structure equals to zero. So that's the, the, the bottom line actually that I calculated. So I can spend less in that configuration, less than seven, uh, 755 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, I hope that answers Daniel's, Daniel's question sufficiently. Um, you also have a couple of questions from Sathe. So uh, first, what was the inlet pressure te and temperature to the CCS unit? And also what is the percentage molar uh, molar percent, sorry, of the CO2? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, the inlet pressure, you see like in the CCS unit uh, uh, before the compression, that's it. Uh, said, I don't know if I... I don't know because if... it depends, it, it depends because uh, it depends on the, the composition of the, the flue gases. Because I, I'm going to, to dewater the the flue gases so I, I i have like something less than than the atmospheric pressure you know so it depends on the composition because i'm i'm playing with uh the the composition of the 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 the, oxy, the oxygen and the rich air so i can like um how do you say I can spend less than the minimum work of separation the, in the air separation unit. And I can allow some nitrogen to go to the oxy combustion system. So uh, it really depends on how uh, 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 I will calculate, you know, but the, the outlet pressure is uh, eight, uh, eight, uh, 80 bars. And what's the, the CO2 percentage? Uh, it, it would depend actually of the, uh, the, the composition of the flue gases as well. So there's like a bunch because those parameters and controllable and controllable parameters are parameters that uh, they vary, you know, and they influence the, the CO2, the CO2, more CO, the CO2 mole percentage and the inlet pressure as well. So it, it would depend. Okay. Do you have like a range or anything like that that you can think of? Or I I can send you then. The, the, I, yeah, I, maybe. I don't have it over here, but yeah, yeah I can. Cool. Send it. Cool. Okay. There's also a question from Sharon um, that says, in your model, do you consider the carbon in the sugar and ethanol outputs to be captured as well, or just the CO2 that's captured by the the CCS step? Only the CO2 that is captured by the CCS, and uh, in the fermentation steps both in the, the, the ethanol, the, the first generation ethanol production and the second generation. Those CO2 that because uh, when you fermented, uh, fermented the, the, the treated juice, uh, 
we will like have uh, some uh, CO2 as residue. So I'm not taking them into account as well. Awesome, thanks. Um, if anybody else got any final questions, please speak now. I have a quick question. Um, so in the in the life cycle assessment of the, of the whole system, um, it's not my area, so excuse my ignorance if I get this wrong, but is um, are any emissions or change in emissions from say land use change from growing the crop, are they factored into that life cycle assessment? Yeah, uh, because uh, the life cycle assessment actually is like laterally inserted into my work, so I'm not so expert on it. Uh, that's why I'm having the, the help of uh, my co-supervisor co here in, at the University of Glasgow. But yeah, I'm actually, I am uh, considering, I'm considering uh, those values, like constant values, and then only the industrial phase that uh, is influenced by the parameters. So I don't know if I, if I uh, answer your question, but I don't know a lot of things about life cycle assessment as well. Cool. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Cool, awesome. Um, I don't think there are any more questions for now. So thank you very much again, Louis, and, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, just to remind everyone that this has been recorded, so there will be a recording if you want to relive the experience and visit, revisit any of the talks. Um, thanks again to Nadine, Nikolaus, uh, Guy, CJ, and Louis. Um, and yeah, just one final plug to get registering for the spring, the spring conference and make use of those early career funds. Thanks very much, everybody.